Welcome to Inspiration and Transformation from the Banks of the Ganga with Sadvi Bhagwati Saraswati, an American sannyasi living at the Parmarth Nikitan Ashram in Rishikesh, India. Sadvi is president of the Divine Shakti Foundation, a charitable organization bringing education, vocational training, upliftment, and empowerment programs to women and children. Sadvi is also Secretary General of the Global Interfaith Wash Alliance and Director of the world famous International Yoga Festival. Join the musings of an American sannyasi as Sadvi shares the wisdom and teachings of her guru, His Holiness Pujya Swami Chidanand Saraswatiji. Welcome, everyone, to inspiration and transformation from the holy banks of the sacred Ganga River in the land of Rishikesh, India. Are you real? Yes. Okay, so what do you mean? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, stick with your first instinct. Don't second guess yourself. Okay? I don't know. Okay. You are real? I don't know. No, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. You asked a question, I'm giving you an answer. Okay? You are real. And we know you are real, not just because I can see you. Because even if I close my eyes, you're still real. Okay? Now, you exist. Okay? Right? Do we agree that you exist? Yes. Okay, good. Yes, you exist. Now, I've closed my eyes. Do you still exist? I think yes. Yes, of course. But I can't see you. I can't use my organ of sight to see you. Okay. Now, I don't touch you anymore. Still can't see you. You don't have any kind of smell. You must have had a good shower today. <laughs> You're not speaking right now, so I can't hear you. I can't taste you. Do you still exist? I think yes. Yes, of course. Now, most of us identify our existence based on the physical body. What that means is that we are able to know each other and to know our existence only through those five senses. But we've just clarified, what is your name? Arsh. Arsh, beautiful. So we've just clarified that Arsh exists even when I cannot see him, cannot smell him, cannot hear him, Cannot touch him or taste him. He still exists. Now, how old are you? Nine. Okay. Do you remember when you were two or three? No. Okay, what's the earliest that you remember? What's your, your longest ago memory? Three or four. Okay, that's okay. That's okay, great. Now, when you were three or four, did you say I? Do you remember using the word I or me or mine when you were three or four? Maybe you had a toy that you really liked and someone tried to take it and you said, that is mine. Or you had cookies and somebody tried to take them and you said, those are mine. Do you remember anything like that? No, but I think... Something like that happened. Yes, I think so too. I think so too. So, at three or four, you existed, and you were understanding that you existed. Because you said, I, me, mine. You understood, this is my truck, my toy, my cookies, not yours. Means, there is a me, mine. Now, when you are nine... Also, you have some sense of I? Yes. Yes. Good.
But the I when you were three or four must be very different from the I today, no? I think so. So what's the same? Your body has changed. Every single cell of your body has changed. Every cell of your body has changed. How you understand has changed. What you do has changed when you were three or four. I imagine you probably just played, maybe made a mess that mom had to clean up. But now when you're nine, I bet you also go to school and you study and maybe you help mom and dad and do... I attend... You attend school? Yeah. Lovely. So what you do is different. How you think is different. Your body is different. So what's the same? I. But what is that I then? What's the same? That, um... I know, it's a hard question. But think about it. What's the same? Me. Mm -hmm. And who, who is that me? Because at three, if I said to you, Arsh, you would have given me a very different answer than if I ask you today, who are you? So your answer to that question of who are you would change. So who's that me that's the same? And it's going to be the same when you're 30 and 50 who is that? It's a really hard question. I know. <laughs> I know. But it's, it's, it's probably the most important question you will ever get in your whole life. You want me to give you some ideas? Or you want a few more minutes to think about it? I want the minutes. Okay, great. I can't give the answer. Okay, no problem. No problem. I'm going to just turn this off. We have a sensitive sound system. So, it's the most important question because only by knowing who we are can we actually live a meaningful life. Now, if I say to you, if, if we didn't have this whole background, and I, no, I don't mean this type of background. I mean the background like our interaction right now. If we had not been speaking and I just met you outside and I said, oh, you are so handsome. Who are you? And you said, oh, I'm Arsh. Maybe you would tell me I'm nine. Maybe you would tell me where you come from. Maybe you would say, this is my mom. This is my dad. Maybe you would tell me that you attend school. Your information, exactly, your information. But that isn't really you, because we've just clarified that when you were three, you also said I. But everything else is different, except your mom and dad, of course. But everything else about who you are is different. So who is that I? Well, in our spiritual teaching, what we are told is that I that is the soul, which never changes. The body keeps changing. Your relationships, your relationships keep changing. So much keeps changing. Today you're in school. In a few years, you'll be in a different school. Then you'll be in college and university. Then you won't be in school at all. You'll have a job. Then maybe you'll have a different job. Then eventually you'll retire from your job. Again, you won't have a job. But who you are stays the same. Before you were born even. After you leave your body even. Because the I is not in the body. Body keeps changing, right? So if... If the eye stays the same even when the body changes, then the eye is not in the body, right? You don't exist in your elbow, do you? 
me is not there, right? No. So it's not there, not in your knees. Have a good look. Not, not there. It's not in the body. It's the soul. What did you say? The outer body. The outer body. I would say the inner body. This body, you can kind of think of it as outer, but you know, the soul can also be outer. It's not only inner. It's inner as in how we feel it, because it's deep, but it, it's infinite. It's infinite. It's ever, ever expanding and infinite. That paradox. That's the soul. No beginning, no end. That's who you are. And I, I give you all of this because that soul, that soul, that truth of who you are is one with God. And by knowing who you are, by knowing who you are, then you know that God exists. See, if you think that you're only your body, only the bones and the muscles. People always say that God is inside you. God is not only inside you, God is you. Inside you where? In your liver? In your kidneys? In your lungs? In your heart? So where inside? So you're Another tough to, question. Hmm? You're trying to say that I am God, mm -hmm. but I'm, I don't know it. Exactly. Exactly. Everyone is God, but, to, but they don't know it. Absolutely. Would you like to run satsang from now on? <laughs> don't worry. It was just a joke. <laughs> Exactly. Now, you have a body, and you've spent your whole life thinking that you are the body. And so you forget that you're God. But when you really go within and you ask questions like, who is that me that was the same me when I was three and is going to be the same me when I'm 30 and 50 and 80 and 100? Who is that? Not in the cells of my body. The cells keep changing. Every cell of my body keeps changing. So, so where is that me? Well, that's the soul. That's, that's who you are. You're just in this body. It's like you ride in a car, right? Sometimes. You must have been in a car sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That was an easy question. So when you're in the car, the car is going someplace, it's moving, but you understand that you're not the car, right? So if, if while you were driving in the car, let's say somebody called you and on the phone they said to you, who are you? And you said, oh, now I'm Muzafranagar. They say, no, 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 I didn't say, where are you? I said, who are you? And you said, uh, now I'm Rorky. Then they would think, right? They would laugh. They would think either your phone is bad, no signal, or you have gone a little, a little crazy, uh, right? Because we understand that where my car has reached is not who I am. That's just where my car is. Now in Muzaffarnagar, and half an hour, then in Rurki, eventually in Haridwar, and then Rishikesh. But that's not who I am. But in the same way... That makes no sense. Okay, well, done. Let me make it make sense. If you say to me, I am nine-year-old Arsh, and I am... Do you know how tall you are? How tall are you? 
approximately? How many centimeters or meters? Hmm? Feet. I'm sorry? Or feet, either way. Whatever metrics you use, any idea? Maybe you're about three feet? Approximately. Let's call four, you... five feet? No, you're not five feet. No, no four, four, five feet. Four, four, okay. Four, three, four. Oh, okay, three, four. yeah, okay. So we'll call, we'll call you... Four, four. Oh, okay, no problem. You can be four. We'll call you four feet. So do you know how much you weigh, approximately? How many kgs, approximately, or pounds? I'm not going to tell you in the public. <laughs> Pick a number. Pick a number that you would feel happy to say in public. Any 30? number. 30. Okay. So if you say to me, I am Arsh. I am 4 feet 30 kg, 9 years old. That is the same thing as saying you are Muzaffarnagar. Because you, Arsh, are not your body any more than you are the car. This body is nine years old. It's about four feet tall. It's about 30 kgs. We call it Arsh. But that's not who you are. Because remember, when you were three, you were already saying me. But when you were three, you were probably maybe only one and a half feet tall, two feet tall. And maybe only like maybe... Half twi- feet. Half. Oh, half feet. Okay. Boy, you had a growth spurt. Okay. Half a foot tall at three? No, it's just like... <laughs> don't even know. So let, let's say half a foot tall at three. How many kgs were you then? Would be in a 10, 11. Okay. So at that time, you were three years old, half a foot, 10, 12 kgs... But how could that be the same me if me is nine years old and four feet tall and 30 kgs? Which is me? Both. How is that possible? Because the soul is the same. Exactly. Exactly. So whatever happens to the body, you're not your body. You are the soul inside. You are the soul. The body will keep changing, but you are the soul. So that soul is one with God. And when you feel, when you experience the presence of that soul, then you experience the presence of God. Um, What does that relate to? My question was that... Is Does God real? Is God real? So I've just given you a way to know, to feel God. To feel that God is real. Because here's the dilemma. I can say to you, yes, God is real. And I can give you all kinds of evidence. Okay? Now... No one knows. I'm sorry? No one knows. Everyone. Everyone who has experienced God knows. Let me ask you something. Do you love your mother? How about your father? Is there anyone you love fully? My grandmother. Fantastic. Fantastic. So, is that love real? According to me, yes. Okay. How do you know? Show it to me. How much does it weigh? It doesn't weigh. Okay. So, how do we know it's real? Show me. Put that love in my hands and show me that that love is real. It is real, but we can't, we can't do it with our physical body. We can't see it, we can't hear it, we can't, sm- we can't smell it, we can't touch it. We, like, we cannot um, like, do it physically. Exactly. It's just a mentally, mental thing. But not mental. You don't love your grandma only with your brain. With everything. Right, right. People see that... Uh, that um, I love that man, I love that woman with my heart. With your heart, but with all of who you are, right? You feel it in your whole being. Yes. Yeah. So in the same way, 
even though we can't see God or know God with our physical body, not with our eyes, our ears, our nose, there's no weight. I can't stick God in your hands and prove to you that God exists. But you know that you love your grandmother. You know that love exists. And that's in the same way that we know that God exists. Not because we can prove it. Not because I can show you how much God weighs or what color God is or what box God is in. Beautiful. So God manifests in many ways. And all of those ways have different beautiful forms. Um, but we don't know how he looks. How he, 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 looks, he looks like everything. He looks like you sometimes. The God in you looks like you. When you look in the mirror, I, just see, I want you to see God. How can I see a mirror? How can I see God in a mirror? I just see myself, my physical body. Well, you see you've got this nice tea luck that's been put there on your third eye? Um, you remember that you have that on your third eye right now? Oh, yeah. Yeah? A trident. A uh -huh, trident. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Exactly. And beneath that, there's a little tea luck that's been put. You've got the trident, and then there's a little tea luck right beneath that. They must have put it on in the mandir. there. But it's perfect because the way that we see and know is with our third eye. These two eyes only see physical form. They see form, they see movement, they see light. But this eye is the eye that sees the divine. And that's why we put tilak on. So when you look in the mirror, it's not that you see God, oh, that's God's nose. It's not that. But when you look in that mirror, I want you to look in your eyes with your third eye. Feel that trident there every day, all the time. I, I do that sometimes and I feel really weird. It just like a really, really weird feeling. Like when sometimes I times um, sometimes go time spending with my grandmother it's just a feeling in my heart mm -hmm. I feel it beautiful. beautiful but I can't express it that's okay you don't need to I cannot express it but it's just a feeling that I that I um yes I cannot explain yes. it you don't need to explain it's, it the experience was grateful mm. it was polite Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. So this is how we know God exists, because we feel it, we know it, and we can't necessarily prove it, we can't even necessarily explain it very well. I know, um, I think, so we know that God's real, and I have have to know that souls are also real. You're listening to OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. OM Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single Circle of Hearts Radio is a sanctuary on the airwaves. Join me, Grandmother Alaya, in the circle on Sunday, 2 p.m. Eastern, as I share information to both enlighten and nourish your soul. Hi, this is Christina Ricci with Rain. Every two minutes, another American is sexually assaulted. If you or someone you know has been sexually assaulted, you are not alone. Help is just a call or click away through the National Sexual Assault Hotline. Please call 1-800-656-HOPE, that's H-O-P-E, or visit RAIN.org, that's R-A-I-N-N dot O-R-G. Brought to you by RAIN and this station. Welcome back to Inspiration and Transformation. 
I'm so glad to have you all back here with me. When we take vows of sannyas, official vows of renunciation, there are practices of freeing oneself of karma, our long-term karma, our medium-term karma, our short-term karma. But it comes as part of a package deal because it comes when you do actually the cremation of yourself. So there's a, there's a ritual that when you take sannyas, you do a fire ceremony that is literally your own cremation where the entire past being is burned, no longer exists. And of course, it's not just a ritual. You have to fully be prepared to live like that. And so the the burning of karmas comes as part of a package of the burning of the entire being, a total renunciation. A lot of the karma is associated with a lot of aspects of our dharma. But that's why also, for example, you take people who were Brahmin, for example, and who have had the sacred thread ceremony. Well, then that's part of a a very strong aspect of their dharma, you could say. But when you take sannyas, the sacred thread goes. It all goes. So even things that are, you could say, positive or spiritual or powerful or, you know, beneficial on those levels, those also go. So it's that full package of you are no longer of any family, of any caste, of any heritage. You are just the being. So that's the full package. And obviously it's a very in-depth and intense package. And it's not something that comes just in a ritual or just in wearing certain clothes, but it's actually something that comes with a practice that continues to be a practice every day of letting go. This is OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. Om Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Om Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Do you have time to read that inspiring book or that blog post you've been meaning to get to? In your busy world, how do you improve yourself and keep your life going? I'm Lisa Kay, and my Between Heaven and Earth radio show can transform your life just by listening. Be uplifted with inspiring topics, positive stories, and ideas that really work. Between Heaven and Earth radio is conscious living for your soul every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Like Baldwin with people for the ethical treatment of animals. I grew up loving circuses and other traveling animal shows, but it never occurred to me what life might be like for the animals. Training wild animals to do things they don't understand takes force. Routine discipline with a hook or whip with the heel of a boot shows the animal exactly who's the boss. Don't patronize animal acts. Please contact people for the ethical treatment of animals. 757-622-PETA Welcome back. 
This is Sadvi Bhagavati Saraswati with inspiration and transformation. The real transformation can only come when you experience it. And I always tell people this, when you listen to more and more of the satsangs, you'll hear that. I always say, you know, I can tell you that you are the soul. But ultimately, that's not going to change anything for you until you experience it. Yesterday, the question was asked by a very sweet nine-year-old child. So there's a way that one responds to a a beautiful child with questions um, such that they don't feel wrong for having asked it. But absolutely, all of the literature, all of the discourses, the lectures, these are, as we say, fingers pointing to the truth. And that's why satsang, the word literally means in the presence of truth. It doesn't mean the answers to all your questions. And the power of the presence of truth is that we experience it. That's what the point of satsang is. is it's It's not supposed to be about a philosophical thing. And very frequently, when you listen to more or come more frequently, I hope, you'll see a lot of times people will ask very esoteric, sort of philosophical types of questions. And my response always is, I can do that with you, but that's not really of any benefit. You knowing the difference between this word and that word seem the same. It's a philosophical issue. It's a semantic issue. There's plenty of courses and classes and books and dictionaries and etymologies and whatnot. But in satsang, it's actually supposed to be about that which enables you to experience the truth. And so the answers to the questions are of benefit if I can use that answer to experience my life differently. So if I learn, ah, I am soul. Like he learned. It took him a while, but it was beautiful. It was beautiful to watch him get it. He was so smart. In just a few minutes, he really, really got it. Now, when he thinks about himself, When he thinks, who is Arsh? He's no longer ever in his life, I don't think, going to identify himself based on his body, based on his relationships. Somewhere in his mind, it's always going to be there. Oh, wait. I'm not that. And that becomes the experience. But if you come in just with the what's the philosophical answer to my question? Then you're absolutely right. It's not going to change you. But if you can use it to allow yourself to change, and whether it's changing because I understand, even I've read it before, I've heard it before, I know it, but maybe now I was able to actually feel it to actually realize it. Whether it's questions like that about the soul or whether it's how do we navigate our relationships and our in-laws and our marriage, whatever sorts of questions arise, because they all arise, the ultimate goal is that the experience of the person who asked, but also of everybody, of all of us, including me, that experience changes. The internal experience changes. And when our internal experience changes, then we are different, and then we live differently. And then our whole life changes. 
And that's why it's in the presence of truth. That's why it's not me sitting here as a teacher telling you things. I did that for a year in between my undergraduate degree and my PhD degree. I did I was a teacher for a year. It was fun. But it wasn't something that I would have gone back to and done forever. Being here and being in satsang is very different than teaching a class. Number one, because the goal is not to get people to memorize things. So many people, we all know them, have read a lot, have learned a lot, have memorized a lot. They give a lot of great answers, great discourses. And personally, they are miserable. Miserable. Right? How many people do we know who can recite shloka after shloka? But you walk into their home, you see their relationships in the home, you see how they live, and you think, my God. Right? Because they're not living it. They're just speaking it. So this is not about memorized facts. I never will say to people, okay, so today we're going to learn. It's never about that. You want to learn those things? You've got so much. I mean, there's so many classes these days. You can learn everything online. Satsang is about, can you actually learn something that's going to change your experience? Can you have a different awareness, a different realization about yourself? And that's why, that's why we call it satsang rather than a class. We are together, all of us. It's not me giving you answers. I always say it's not, it's not my knowledge. I have been incredibly blessed to be able to serve as, a, as an instrument for that which needs to be spoken. But I feel very much like this microphone. You know, no one would ever say, oh, wow, that great talk that microphone gave. We understand the microphone's just an instrument. And in the same way, I actually feel very much like an instrument. I'm very aware. It's not about my knowledge. It's about me getting out of the way, my ego, my identity, my sense of self, getting out of the way enough such that whatever is meant to flow can flow. And then together, all of us are in this presence of truth. So you're absolutely right. Yeah, it's not, it's not about just trying to get an answer to appease your brain or appease the mind. It's actually about getting an answer that's going to change you. And that's up to you. It can happen when you read a book. It can happen when you're listening to a talk online. It can happen when you're sitting in a kata. It can happen in satsang. It can happen sitting on a bus. There's no rule about when your awareness is going to happen. It's up to you of when are you going to actually allow those truths to become your truth. Today you've heard it again. Maybe today will be the day. If not, maybe we'll talk about it again tomorrow. That'll be the day. But it's up to you to decide. When am I going to stop listening just with my brain and my ears? When am I going to stop thinking about what my next question is or what my responses or what my argument to that is or my reaction is and actually 
allow that experience to happen for you. And that's the invitation. This is OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. OM Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. OM Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Do you have time to read that inspiring book or that blog post you've been meaning to get to? In your busy world, how do you improve yourself and keep your life going? I'm Lisa Kay, and my Between Heaven and Earth radio show can transform your life just by listening. Be uplifted with inspiring topics, positive stories, and ideas that really work. Between Heaven and Earth radio is conscious living for your soul every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Like Baldwin with people for the ethical treatment of animals. I grew up loving circuses and other traveling animal shows, but it never occurred to me what life might be like for the animals. Training wild animals to do things they don't understand takes force. Routine discipline with a hook or whip with the heel of a boot shows the animal exactly who's the boss. Don't patronize animal acts. Please contact people for the ethical treatment of animals. 757-622-PETA Welcome back. This is Sadvi Bhagavati Saraswati with inspiration and transformation. If our soul, if the soul is just one, undivided, unable to be broken, we're all just one, one soul. And if the soul is absolutely pure, doesn't take, have any taintedness, any darkness, anything on the soul, which is what we believe about the soul, then how is it that our karma, our sanskaras, that which we say go with us from one life to another life, how do they go with us? If there's no impressions on the soul, how do we carry these things from lifetime to lifetime? Agar may answer ang gareji may dun to so much paengi? Simple English. Done. Beautiful, beautiful. With the soul, when the soul travels at the end of each life, with the soul goes also what we call the subtle body. Man, buddhi, ahankard. Wo ja rahe apne atma ke saath. To, to atma ke saath, to subtle body ja rahe, to apne man mein, jo sanskard, jo imp- impressions kaha hoti hai? Impressions to man mein hoti hai. Chahe we say good sanskaras, you say, ha, ladki to bhot sanskari hai. Matab achi ladki hai. Ladka to bhot sanskari hai. Matab, parents have raised him well. Good boy. Good boy, good girl. In that way, we mean sanskari. But also we have sanskars of experiences that we've had. If you go through trauma, for example, it leaves a sanskar. It leaves an impression. People who have really suffered, there's an impression. So the impression itself can be from anything. When we speak about the rites of passage, our sola sanskars, those are what you could think of as sort of the positive types of sanskars that we give these impressions to the psyche. Okay? So the impressions are not on the soul. The impressions are on what we call the psyche. Matlab man. But man ke saat, just say emotional life, feeling life, personality. That all goes together. Angreji mein hum psyche bolte hain. Haan, wohi mein kehdi hun, haan. Apne jo subtle body kehte hain, wo atma ke saat hi jate hain. Ji. Thank you. 
थैंक्स हाँ हाँ लेकिन इन द इटर्नल एग्जिस्टेंस केवल आत्मा ही है पर जब हम जीव आत्मा के बारे में बात करते हैं तो जीव आत्मा के साथ ही ये सरल बारे भी जाते हैं इट्स लाइक थिंक अबाउट द ओशन ओके बट इमेजिन कि पूरा यूनिवर्स में एक ही सागर होते हैं अब तो काफी सारे सागर हैं बट इमेजिन कि बस एक ही सागर है जस्ट वन ओशन ओके दैट्स ऑल देयर इज Now in the ocean there are waves. Now in the wave jab hum wave ko dekhenge we say ye kya hai? Well there's two answers. Both are true. Answer number 1 ye ek wave hai. Answer number 2 ye ocean hai. Now the wave itself is not an illusion. जब हम माया के बारे में बात करते हैं अलॉट ऑफ टाइम्स वी मिस अंडरस्टैंड दिस आइडिया ऑफ अल्यूजन इट डजेंट मीन आर आईज आर प्लेइंग ट्रिक्स ऑन अस इट डजेंट मीन दैट वट आई एम सीइंग इज सम मैजिक दैट इज इन देयर लाइक वी सी वाटर इन द डेजर्ट फार अवे एंड इट रियली इज इन देयर नॉट एग्जैक्टली इट्स नॉट अ मराज माया इज नॉट द मराज When we say illusion what it means is if we look at the wave and we say ye kaval ek wave hai ye wave hi hai well that is an illusion because ultimately the highest truth of the wave is ocean even when it's a wave if you take a spoonful of it and you take that spoonful to a science laboratory and you give it to the scientist and he looks at it under the microscope he will say this is ocean he will not say this is wave which is why our truth when we speak about who we are when the guru looks at us when we come in front of god well what they're seeing is ocean that's our highest truth now but the wave is not a mirage so it's not an illusion in that way it's not an optical illusion if you go out into the wave with a surfboard you will understand it's not an illusion if you go out into the wave without a surfboard and you cannot swim you will learn very quickly a illusion ni Right? Any time you think the wave is an illusion, go out in the ocean and try to swim in a big wave. As you have a mouthful of sand and you can't breathe because you're face down now on the floor of the ocean. You will understand, ah, I guess it wasn't that type of illusion. The illusion that we speak about meaning, it's not the highest truth. because it's always changing atma doesn't change like god doesn't change atma just is but jeevatma that is traveling with the subtle body working out its karmic bank account that you can think of like the wave it's still ocean like jeevatma is still atma atma se alag to nahi hai wave ocean se alag nahi hai even in the height of its waveness it's still ocean even in the height of our ignorance illusion personhood individual personhood Ultimately the truth of who we are is still atma no matter how lost we are in our stories in our dramas that doesn't change the truth we are atma but the jeev atma with the subtle body 
is going through its karmic package. And one aspect of the karmic package are these sanskaras, these impressions. So the impressions are happening upon that psyche or upon that jivatmaka package, you can think about it. Impression usme parai. That's why, it's why we meditate. If it was only soul and there was nothing but soul, why meditate? Why chant? Why pray? Why do sadhana? If all we are is one big soul, there's no individual souls, there's no karmic packet, there's no nothing. Enjoy your life because the minute you die anyway, you were soul, you are soul, there's nothing, nothing to be done. But what we know is that actually there's this jivatma and this subtle body that has a karmic package. And I'm going to keep having to go through this cycle of birth and death and reincarnation until that karmic package is finished. If everything I do, every karm I do, is giving me some kind of fruit, and as Bhagwan Krishna said, you can't not act. You are always acting. Even you sit down, you close your eyes, you sit on your hands, you plug your ears, you're still acting. So that's when Arjuna asks, so then what to do? And this is when Bhagwan Krishna explained, realize, just surrender unto me. Just surrender it. And so as as we are traveling as this Jeev Atma package, ultimately the goal is how much can we surrender? How free can we become of all of the drama so that these impressions don't keep forming, that we have to keep coming back lifetime after lifetime to work out? Or jo sadna apne ki, jo man ki purity apne kiya, that purification of the mind, it stays with you. Neto, if we only had one lifetime to get enlightened, that would be kind of difficult, right? If, if the subtle body did not go with the jivatma, then it would mean every lifetime was a clean slate and you had to start all over again. But luckily, that purification of the mind, that sadhana we've done, it travels with us. This brings to a close this hour of inspiration and transformation. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm so glad to be together with you all each week. And I look forward to being together again next Thursday, same time, on Ohm Times Radio. Mm-hmm.